Actually, let's go back to, because before the second vision of the horns and the craftsmen in verses 18 through 21, the prophet says something important. Look at verse 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, this is interpreting angel, cry thou, or you, cry, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I'm very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. Remember, we saw the heathen were at ease, but not God's people. And he was very displeased. He says, I was a little displeased, but they helped forward the affliction. Now, he used those kingdoms to, shall we say, punish Israel um, and his people, but they took it too far. And so he was not happy with that. Verse 16 Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So that was his promise. Verse 17, cry yet. We saw that that corresponds with Revelation 10. Prophesy again. Cry yet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall be spread abroad and the Lord shall comfort Zion. This is a message of comfort, my friends, and shall choose Jerusalem. Then he sees the vision of the nations and how God takes care of nations, sets them up, and takes them down. Now he's going to show how God's people receive his glory. Chapter 2 and verse 1. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And as I said... This is the man, Christ Jesus. If you look back to verse 8 of chapter 1, it says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding a red horse. This is the same man. It's the pre-incarnate Christ. And he knows the future and controls the future of nations. And he knows and controls the future of his church. The measuring man pays attention to details. Friends, there's nothing in your life that he doesn't know about that he can't help you with. That's our Christ. That's the measuring man from verse 1. Verse 2, then said I, where are you going? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth and another, or messenger, and another angel went out to meet him and said, run, speak to this young man. That is, tell this to Zechariah saying Jerusalem shall be inhabited as a town without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, thus says the Lord, will be unto her a wall. So they didn't need literal walls, they had something better. I will be unto her a wall, a fire roundabout, and it will be the glory in her midst. All right, let's full stop right there and unpack some of this. So his church would be, he promises, like a city without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle that dwell in it. John the Revelator beheld in vision, after he saw the 144,000, Revelation 7, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations that stood before the throne with palm branches in their hands, praising God and praising the lamb before the throne. Zechariah says here that it will be too big to have walls. There won't be any need for walls because God himself will be a wall of fire around it. And he'll also be the glory in her midst. All right, go with me to, keep your finger there, go with me to Revelation 14 because there is an important message there. In fact, in Revelation 14, we have something called the three angels' messages. And if you look on to verse six, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this is gonna be to the multitudes, and many will accept. Saying with a loud voice, what does he say? Fear God and give glory to him. So this is the glory in the midst. 
that Zechariah is talking about. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And then we have the second angel's message and so does Zechariah, but we'll stop here for a moment. So God would be a wall of fire around them and he would be the glory in their midst. The way we give God glory is to let his glory be in us. Let me say that again. The way we give God glory is to let his glory be in us, to fear him. What does it mean to fear God? I think we've got time to go to this. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. And I got you running here today, I know. Deuteronomy chapter 10. But it's important to understand, what does it mean to fear God, which is what the revelator says? Deuteronomy 10 says this, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Good question. But to fear the Lord your God. And I love how the Old Testament says, it doesn't just say the Lord, it says the Lord your God, right? It's a personal thing between you and him, the Lord your God, to fear him, to walk in all his ways. So these are, these are synonymous, this is Hebrew parallelism, right? So it's, we're getting it one way and we're getting other uh, views of this, right? To fear the Lord thy God is to walk in all his ways, is to love him, is to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Verse 13, to keep the commandments of the Lord. All this is involved in fearing the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. Are the commandments for our good? Absolutely, that's what scriptures tell us. Over in Deuteronomy 13, it adds that we cleave to him. Hold on, this is what fear, uh, part of fear means. 13 verse four says, and you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. That is hold on, right? Just, just, you know, don't let him go until he blesses you, right? This is what it means to fear God and give glory to him. These two things come together. Now, interestingly enough, these walls, right? They didn't need walls. They didn't need physical walls because God would be a wall of fire around them. Now, think about this, both personally and church-wise. Do we sometimes put up walls that are man-made? Because this wall of fire was not man-made, amen? Listen, friends, let God be your wall. In other words, don't depend on things but depend entirely on the Lord. And I think if COVID, the years of COVID taught us anything, it should have taught us this. There is nothing that you can trust except God, amen? Amen. Nothing. And I mean, I knew there was a lot of things I couldn't trust, but I found some new ones in the COVID year that I couldn't trust. Walls should be used for protection of those inside, Amen? amen? God will not just be a wall, but a wall of fire. We think of fire as destructive. But did you know that it is the righteous that dwell with fire? Did you realize that? Let's Let's go to that. Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah 33, we think of fire as destructive, and it is. We think of judgment as negative, and it's not always. Sometimes it is. Judgment can be in favor of the saints or otherwise. We're in Isaiah 33 right now and we're talking about fire and glory. 33 verse 14 says this, and this is in the context of the very last days. If you go back to verse two, we know that. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in time of trouble. So this is in the very last times, verse 14. And sinners in Zion are afraid, fearful have, fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. And then this question, who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Well, that's the wicked, isn't it? Oh, well, keep reading. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? 
That's definitely the wicked. Oh, look at verse 15. He that walks uprightly or righteously and speaks uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppression, that shakes his hands from holding of bribes or doesn't make vows in that way, that stops his ears from hearing of blood, that shuts his eyes from the seeing of evil. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. So it's that fire that God, that wall of fire will be around us and in us even in the last days and even into the heavenly kingdom. And so God wants to put his glory within us, amen? Christ, Colossians 1.27 speaks of Christ, this, this great mystery that the last days would reveal. Christ in you, the hope or the assurance of glory, amen? Oh God, put your glory within us, amen? That's what I'm talking about, that's what I need, that's what I want today, that glory. All right, we're going back now to Zechariah and looking at our verses there. Both of them speak of glory. And now verse six and onward, six says ho, ho, not ho, 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 ho. Come forth and flee from the land of the north. What is the land of the north? It's Babylon, friends. Saith the Lord, for I have s- spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, says the Lord. So here is an announcement to come out of Babylon. Friends, that is the second angel's message. Come out of Babylon. Verse seven, deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwell with the daughter of Babylon. Huh, interesting, does Babylon have daughters? Revelation 17, right? The mother of harlots. We see it here, just like we see it in the book of Revelation. And so come out. God is calling today a people to come out, amen? To come out and to come in, to come out of air, to come out of confusion, and to come into Bible truth, amen? God has set this church to be that beacon of truth, amen? Amen. It's exactly what he set us to be. I don't say it proudly, it's just what it is, right? God has made us the repository of these last day truths, this restoration of all things that Acts 3.21 talks about. It can only be, and we must be about God's business, amen, of calling people out of Babylon. There's so much confusion out there in various religions. Amen? And not just the mother church that is, we're to call out of. We know what that is, right? That's the papacy. That's clear. But also the daughters, the many daughters, Protestantism and other religions need to come out. And they will come out, friends. They'll come out in droves. God has a huge uh, awakening coming before us, before he comes. There will be an awakening. We must call people out of Babylon. And it's for their own good, amen? Confusion is just that. I mean, it confuses you. It's it's not anything someone wants to walk in for very long. How many of you have ever had a spell of dizziness? Right, I tell you, give me me a stomach flu, give me a head flu, give me it, just don't make me dizzy. (laughs) Just don't like being dizzy. It's, It's just, it's disequilibrium, right? That's what the world is going through right now. God has given us these truths to give to them in the last days. Oh, friends, don't shut it up like the Jews did. Let's go out there and share this gospel of the everlasting kingdom before it's too late for others. So come out, come out of Babylon. Come out from the daughters of Babylon. Verse eight, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory has he sent me unto the nations which have spoiled you. For he that touches you, touches what? The apple of his eye, the pupil of his eye, right? Unless you wear contact lenses, you don't touch your eye a lot, right? (laughs) Um, And I mean, it's a very sensitive thing. And God is saying, you are that special and sensitive to him today. His church is the apple of his eye, and you are his church. His church is made up of people. It's not the building. He likes the building, but it's you that he's in love with. Amen? 
Come out of Babylon. Come out from the daughters of Babylon. You are the apple of his eye, verse 9. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants or slaves. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts, the God of all armies, that has all power in his hands, hath sent me. That's verse 9. We'll stop there for now. Because again, God has given a message to his last day church. Let's go with me to Revelation. You know it, but we need to look at it. Revelation, we'll go to 14 first, and then to 18, because there are two calls to come out of Babylon. In Zechariah, he says, ho, ho. In the book of Revelation, come out of Babylon, and it's repeated twice there also. That has fallen, has fallen. It's the second angel's message. Verse 7 of Revelation 14. Sorry, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drunk or drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Quite a small, short verse, but it's packed with meaning. Babylon, this is the ancient kingdom of whom Lucifer would be uh, symbolically over, right? It's, a, it's the kingdom, uh, Babel, right? Babe El, where they would try to make their own tower to heaven, right? Their own way to heaven. This is the, the basis of Babylonian religion, right? And God would confuse the languages. But God had already promised that he would never destroy the world with a flood again. So what was their building this tower all about? It was all about unbelief, wasn't it? They didn't believe the promises of God. God had already said up in there, well, just in case, Lord, we want to build this big thing so we can get up on the top in case you do it again. That is Babylon. And Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And this is the result of the first angel's message. This first angel's message is so powerful that it fells Babylon, amen? The truth shall make you free. Come on and say amen. That powerful message of the first angel exposes Babylon and it topples over and God receives the glory. And so Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, great in whose eyes? Great in its own eyes, right? Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, look at this great city that I have built. Oh no, that's not the spirit we want. Come out of that. That great city because she made or forced, so we see this is a kingdom that forces all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then the third angel followed. Go to me to Revelation 18. What we consider the fourth angel's message, it's there also. Revelation 18, verse one. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the earth was lightened with his what? Glory. His glory shall be in our midst, Zechariah says. John the Revelator says, the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There it is repeated. And we are to repeat it in these last days, amen? This message first came out, the second angel's message back in the 1840s, but it needs to be repeated with an understanding of the additional atrocities that have happened since then. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You almost see an entrapment here, right? It's a cage. It's a hold. For all nations have drunk of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Who are the kings of the earth? These are the politicians, amen? These are the nations. But it's not just the kings of the earth. Read on, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants. So this will be both political and it will be economic. It will be a one world last day order, friends, and it's right around the corner. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying what? Come out, come out of Babylon. Why? Because her sins have reached unto heaven. <clears throat> and so that you don't receive of her plagues or be partakers of her sins, come out, 
God says. Come out. Come out of Babylon. Don't dwell with her daughters. Come in to truth. Study this book as if your life depends on it, because it does. Amen? Amen. This is the book that we must align our lives with. We close back in Zechariah because he ends with good news, and so will we. Zechariah chapter 2. We've gone through these verses. Babylon has fallen. And so we saw in those verses, by the way, there are two options, right? Two paths, two things you can worship, two laws you can follow, two things you can fear, right? Two two ones that you can love. We worship the creator or worship the beasts. And there are two judgments. There's a judgment on the earth, but there's a judgment in heaven also. Babylon then is an apostate, antichrist system that forces, we saw that in the scripture, a false gospel. Oh, I wish I had time to expound that, I don't. And also a false day of worship upon the world. It's followed by the world and deceives the whole world. It used politics and Protestants to do its bidding right here in the United States. Prior to COVID, you would have probably said, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, (laughs) let me pull you aside, pastor. This is fanaticism, but not anymore. I think we have seen the lockdowns. We have seen what can take place just like that. And friends, the last movements will be rapid ones. The devil is full of anger because he cannot bind the people into bundles with the world to render to him complete allegiance. Kings, rulers, and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. Interesting. When you read through Revelation, think about that. Who goes to make war with the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? The beast, Antichrist, will use political figures to enforce economic sanctions. Anybody ever heard of economic sanctions? We're doing it all over the place. We've done it, we continue to do it, even at our border with Canada. Political figures to enforce economic sanctions and eventually a death decree. Civil and religious liberty for religious reasons, right? And lately, the big focus has been Mother Earth, right? We've got to save Mother Earth. You've got to keep Sunday because we've got to save Mother Earth. Well, why can't I keep Sabbath and save Mother Earth? No, no, you must keep Sunday to save Mother Earth. Friends, everything is lining up, amen? And if you think I mentioned this before, if you think, oh, you know, that's gonna come from the right, that's come from Republicans, let me tell you something. They're both gonna be working together, amen? It's not gonna be one or the other. It may come from one or the other, but the other side will be right in with them. That we're working together in the last days. Now, the good news is this. There will be a few men who will catch on to the message. Maybe women. Right? Maybe women. Think about Esther. In these last days that will hold back the current. Major political leaders, there would probably be just a few of them, but they'll say, no, we're we're, we're not going for this. We are a nation that believes in religious freedom. Yes, we're a Christian nation, but we don't look down at other religions. That's what this nation was built upon. And they will stand in the way, amen? Amen. They will stand in the gap and hold back that fury that is about to come upon God's people. Well, in Zechariah, the angel was told to run, right? Run. Run and go tell Zechariah this news. Now, I don't think it's because Zechariah needed it that badly because he was like, not sure what was happening. I think it was for the people that were to be called out of Babylon, amen? Amen. That's why he was supposed to run. That's why we are supposed to run. We need to move with alacrity, friends. We do not know how much time we have to share this message. And who could be going to their grave not knowing this message? And don't, don't get me wrong. Other churches members can be saved, and they will be. There'll be lots of all different religions. In fact, one of my mentors used to say, Rob, he said, there'll be a lot of Catholics in heaven. 
there'll be a lot of Protestants. There'll be a lot of Presbyterians in heaven. There'll be a lot of Episcopals in heaven. And there may even be a few Seventh-day Adventists. That's what he used to tell me. So come on, we know that there's wonderful people in all these churches. That's why God is calling them out, amen? Because he loves them. Oh, do we love them enough to be his hand, to call them out of Babylon? We finish up here in verse 10 and onward. Verse 10 says, sing and rejoice. Zechariah 2. O daughter of Zion, for I, for lo, I come. Oh, what good news that is, amen? That event that we are waiting for. Lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, says the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. Repeats it. Anytime you have repetition, there's um, an emphasis there. And again, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. We don't have time to go to Isaiah 60 if you want to write it down. Nations will come into God's people because his glory has come upon us. Isaiah 60 verse 1 and onward says, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent. O all flesh before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Jesus is coming soon, friends. He's coming soon, and he's calling us to be in awe of him, to be silent, but to be working, to be calling people out of Babylon and making sure there's no Babylon in here, amen? Amen. We may not be in Babylon, but it's possible Babylon's in here. Oh, friends, let's ask the Lord to get rid of that thing, amen? amen? Get rid of that confusion. Replace it with your holy truth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord has brought nothing to nothing, the counsel of the heathen, wiped it out. But the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The gates of hell shall not prevail against God's last day church. Come on, say amen. That's you and us. We need to believe it and go forward with it. The gates of hell shall not prevail. God's church will prevail. And you are God's church. Let him have you, friends. And let him be your glorious wall of fire today.